स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया Good morning. We'll continue with our study of Authier theory with reference to Hitchcock. So, Alfred Hitchcock. We were talking about him. We also did a scene from his rope, uh, the opening scene, and uh, we discussed it with reference to mise en scène. Alfred Hitchcock, 1899 to 1990. Now, um, he was a British filmmaker who migrated to America to U.S. So, that's his history. Many of his films were made when he was still made, working in uh, England, but uh, there was there came a time when he was invited by the U, uh, U.S. Uh, film studios to start making pictures in the U.S. So, uh, Rope is one of those films which was made during his stint in the U.S. So, we will be continuing our discussion of mise en scène. Shots, sets, music, actors. Mise en scène includes all this, apart from sound, uh, of course. And uh, we'll also talk about the long take and how Hitchcock introduced this, which has been now done to perfection in many other films also. So, uh, coming to what's a long take? Now, a long take refers to a single unbroken shot. that lasts for a larger amount of time than usual for instance it can even last to 30 seconds in many cases which is unusual a shot doesn't last that long but in rope uh, hitchcock uh, pushed the boundaries and uh, the idea was to give it a stagey feel it's a, it's based on a play the other day we were discussing this uh, based on a play by patrick hamilton and a british playwright and therefore the idea was to be as experimental as an innovative as daring as possible and he succeeded as we have all seen to a large ex- extent and his uh, legacy continues in many films but most notably in a very recent movie 2002 russian ark it's a russian language movie which is a film shot on digital video and uses a single very long take for the entire film so this is extremely innovative so two movies that immediately come to mind for their extensive use of long take hitchcock's rope which was don't forget made in 1948 and considering the limitations of those times technical limitations of those times you can well imagine because after all the russian arc was made in 2002 with all the akutrama of uh, uh, the digital technology but uh, hitchcock pioneer in several ways pioneered this as well now the long take in rope the um, rope is called the ultimate camera spill film uh, that is a chamber film you know chamber film what what do you understand by a chamber film i am going to ask you to give me some examples it's a german term camera spill film camera that is chamber okay film is film yeah so a chamber film tell me it's all shot on a single set okay have you noticed that rope doesn't go outside except the opening shot which is a uh, uh, um, Uh, you know top angle shot of a busy street on a regular day we have already talked about it and how hitchcock juxtaposes that regularity that ordinariness with what's something very irregular something very extraordinary happening inside so it's a chamber piece my uh, question to you is can you give me more example because after all it's based on a play and plays can afford to be completely Uh, located in one single space they don't they need not necessarily move out give me some more examples very well known films yeah 12 angry men 12 angry men yes it's a good example 12 angry men doesn't go out right the action of the movie is set 
in a single room. Therefore, 12, exam, 12 angry men is a very good example of a chemistry film, chamber piece. More recently, you can think of Carnage, hmm? Kate Winslet, Christopher Waltz, who won the Oscar recently. So, uh, um, and uh, in between, I can think of who is afraid of Virginia Woolf. Although they do go out, there is a point when they go out, Richard Burton and George Segal, but that is for a very short, very brief period. Most of the scene takes place inside uh, uh, an apartment. So, that is a chemistry film. Okay. So, rope as we have already seen is seen as a, as a very bold, very innovative denial of editing. We know that editing necessarily involves several cuts, but rope and Hitchcock particularly, they eschew this. At the same time, the presence of the cut despite its illusion could be seen as the definitive test and proof of the centrality rope seems to deny. So, there is a centrality, there is a philosophy which those two characters believe in and rope through its very bold innovative technology, it denies that centrality. We will talk about it later. Now, how does he do that? I have also often uh, referred to this particular scene, but uh, let me repeat. There is a scene when one of the murderers, uh, the, uh, the, murder, the murderer who is more in control, not Philip, but Brandon, he reaches next to the trunk for some books. These are the books that he is planning to uh, showcase to uh, David, the man they have just murdered, David's father. The camera tilts down uh, with his hand and then up uh, into the back of his blue suit and the entire scene is filled with Brandon's blue suit, his back completely, the frame is completely filled. Now, uh, when Hitchcock cuts to a new shot, a shot, it, uh, that, that shot starts exactly where the last one left off. Now, what he is doing is, he is making a cut here, but trying to be very clever, so that people do not notice. Okay. Going to the, going to Brandon's back is one way of uh, uh, drawing attention away from the fact that there is a cut. We, of, we you know the illusion that we get is it is the same single shot, a long take, but he had to resort to cuts of course, and he does that. We were also talking about Hitchcock's uh, interview with the legendary Truffaut and uh, those uh, interviews are available online, also part of a book. So, Hitchcock slash Truffaut 1967 and Hitchcock there uh, tells Truffaut that he undertook the film as merely a stunt. He wanted to prove something and he proved it and wanted what, what uh, propelled this decision was to impose the strict rules of shooting in real time. That was the main idea. The rope gives you an impression, the illusion that the movie is taking place in real time and therefore, he felt that the use of long take justifies, is justified. I am quoting Hitchcock from uh, uh, his Trofa interview. The stage drama was played out in the actual time of the story. The action is continuous from the moment the curtain goes up until it comes down again. I asked myself whether it was technically possible to film it the same way. So, that was the idea, he was just mimic mimicking another kind of art, another art, that was the idea. You have to remember, this is your take away from this lecture. Hitchcock's reputation as an author was crystallized by the Cahiers du Critics uh, and the writers and the fr French new wave directors. So, he owes much of his reputation, much of his uh, uh, legendary status to the works of, to uh, the writings of these critics. And this is the work, Truffaut, Hitch Hitchcock Truffaut is the work that immortalized Hitchcock as an author. Otherwise, he was just seen as a maker of those sensational blood and gore murder kind of movies. But then, uh, the Cahier critics noticed certain things that we have been talking about, especially his mise en scene. He was also extremely innovative in his use of music. 
I urge you to go online uh, YouTube and listen to the uh, Vertigo theme soundtrack. Okay. It is extremely innovative for those times. Of course, Psycho yeah, is still spoofed and used in several ways. Um, long talk uh, take, sorry. So, uh, the legacy of long take continues and Brian De Palma is one of the filmmakers who is extremely influenced by Hitchcock. So, this is a, a shot from Carlito's Way, which was made in 1992, directed by De Palma, starring Al Pacino and Sean Penn. And you can also see this is an elevator shot. Remember, Al Pacino lying on an elevator. So, again a homage to De Palma's, which movie taking place on a steps? Battleship Potemkin, yeah, yeah, Odessa. So, which we have already talked about. De Palma has earlier paid homage to that sequence in The Untouchables, yeah, and he does this again in Carlito's way. So, uh, see, uh, we, we, we have been talking about intertextuality in a, one of our earlier classes. So, it is not plagiarism. They know where, yeah, so if you are a cine enthusiast, you know that the director is paying his homage to. Uh, those legendary filmmakers. So, this climactic uh, shootout in Carlito's way is all shot in a long take. And if you watch it now, it is absolutely breathtaking, because after all it was the movie was done in 1992. So, it had technology has come a long way from 1948. So, if you watch it, Al Pacino is just running down the streets and uh, New York Central Station and then a uh, lot of things happen here there and it is a scene that involves a number of people unlike rope, which is after all a chamber piece and it involves not more than 7 or 8 people. But here it is the entire scene is shot in a crowd, it is a crowd sequence and then having a long take in that. So, extremely innovative and then also legendary scene from Goodfellas, 1989 Scorsese's, when Ray Liotta walks down the back entrance of a restaurant with his girlfriend. That is uh, famously shot in long take. You must go to the YouTube and if you are not aware of these scenes, please do watch Carlito's way, Goodfellas, especially the long takes in them. They are known for these ways. So, we are talking about Hitchcock's legacy. Now, there is another uh, critic, Laura Mulvey, and uh, she is uh, basically a feminist theorist. She has done a lot of work on film studies, and uh, she, she has written an oft quoted essay called Visual Pleasure and Narrative Cinema, in which she says, she gives us the idea of scopophilia. Now, what is scopophilia? Uh, she says that cinema offers a number of possible pleasures and one of these pleasures is scopophilia. In other words, there are circumstances in which looking itself, you know the act of looking itself uh, is a source of pleasure. So, looking at something becomes a source of pleasure, just as in the reverse formation there is pleasure in being looked at. So, in other words, she is talking about the gaze. Do you get me? Uh, the word is, this is one of the key concepts that you should take away. G A Z E, gaze. So, there is a pleasure in looking at something and there is a pleasure uh, which can be derived from being looked at. So, this is called scopophilia. This is one of the uh, possible pleasures of cinema. And she has done this study with special reference to Hitchcock's movies, where she says that people derive a lot of pleasure in looking at something, especially looking at women. Women are objects of, tell me the word, gaze. So, feminist theorists are very fond of using this word, objectification, gaze. When we talk about our representation of fem uh, women in our cinema, we often use this word. 
object of desire is nothing wrong in the being yeah so is a women uh, men only or who well there is a reverse tendency also men can also be objects of gaze but not that often but it's women and laura mulvey's study centered on women being objectified women women being objects of gaze and sometimes they also Hitchcock's yeah, I will show you the connection, just give me a moment. <laughs> so, <laughs> Hitchcock also uses the concept of mirror and doubles and then we will see how the entire pleasure or, or scopophilia comes out. So, I am going to uh, connect the two ideas. So, many of Hitchcockian films deal with the act of looking, gazing at others, hmm? pleasure being derived out of looking. Now, in Psycho, who is, what is the name of that actor? Anthony? Perkins. Perkins, right. So, too many Anthony's going around. So, Anthony Perkins, uh, he looks at uh, Janet Leigh, Janet Leigh character uh, through a wall, through a hole in the wall. He is a peeping Tom, yeah. And how has he camouflaged, how has he covered the hole in the wall? Yeah, not the bird's head, that is another thing, good, but it is not. He has put a portrait or a picture on that particular hole. He removes the picture and looks through, peeps through the hole and looks at Janet Leigh getting undressed. Hmm? So, that is a woman becomes an object of gaze, she is being looked at. So, the Pleasure is all of the person who is watching. Watching, but sometimes it can also be of the person who is being gazed at. But here is that's not the case. Yes, we are talking about voyeur. In other words, in vertigo, vertigo is uh, uh, is also a very good example where uh, the detective, as played by James Stewart, he is being asked by Kim Novak's husband to to keep an eye on his wife. He is not very sure of his wife's comings and goings. So, he says keep an eye on her, I am very uh, anxious about her movements. And we find several scenes where Jimmy Stewart is just gazing at this particular woman, who in turn gazes at a picture in a museum. So, it is all a setup. we know that. Once you watch and if once you watch the movie and then you start thinking, you go backwards and you see how you get trapped by Hitchcock. After all, it is based on a novel, as we were talking about, most of his films are based on other works, yeah, works by other people. Rear window, another classic example, hero is, uh, hero has a broken leg, he is confined to a wheelchair, he has no other option but to uh, stay put. But the only way he entertains himself is by gazing at other people, remember? So, he has a pair of binoculars and he looks at the activities of the people in the building across the street. So, sometimes there is a, an exotic dancer he is looking at, sometimes another family is an old couple always bickering, hmm? a number of people and he gazes at them, scopophilia, voyeurism. Then, uh, he is also very, uh, Hitchcock is also fond of using mirror and shadow doubles. Okay, so, that becomes his authorial practice. And I will give you several examples of characters using or looking at themselves, using a mirror or shadows. So, this double relationship, what does it suggest? Relationship between characters in which often guilt is transferred from one to the other. What shadow of a doubt? What psycho? Mother's murder and then he suffers from the guilt and then what? what is the outcome of that? All women are bad yeah, and they have to be eliminated. So, whenever he is attracted towards any woman and he is def definitely attracted towards Janet Leigh, so she has to be eliminated because that means mother taking over and he has he always hated his mother, hated her so much that he has stuffed her dead body and kept it in the room. So, now I confess his one and only movie with Monty Clift, 
and Anne Baxter and uh, this also plays on the idea of having a double somewhere. I am just giving you a very uh, quick overview of uh, some of his films. Hitchcock's fascination with images, okay, he even looks at himself in a mirror. Blackmail, one of his most celebrated movies, especially for its sound. Uh, he made it once in silent form and another in talking. So, Hitchcock remaking Hitchcock, he was fond of doing that also. So, blackmail has been done twice, both times by Hitchcock. He was very prolific. Watch the movie Anthony Perkins, uh, Anthony Hopkins in Hitchcock, playing Hitchcock. So, this is blackmail and you can see the girl's shadow, 1929, Rebecca based on classic Du Maurier novel of the same name and here the girl, the girl is so nameless, the girl is such a non-entity, she is kept na nameless throughout, right. We never know what Joan Fontaine character is actually called, she has no name, she is just the girl. Who is the whose presence looms large, if you know Rebecca, Rebecca's. Rebecca is Mrs. Deventer, Mrs. Maxine Deventer, the late Mrs. Deventer. So, she has come and she, uh, uh, Laurence Olivier plays this enigmatic aristocrat. His wife is dead, the dead wife is Rebecca. The new woman, who is, the new, the, the second wife, who is a far cry from the beautiful, glamorous Rebecca. Yeah, she always lives in the shadows of the late wife. So, here she is looking at the portrait of Rebecca, the girl looking at first, the second Mrs. Deventer looking at the first Mrs. Deventer. Psycho, look at the mirror shots, several mirror shots, Janet Leigh looking at herself and her image with Anthony Perkins, both in, both reflected in a mirror. So, people looking at each other deriving pleasure from that, also looking at themselves. Claude Rains in Notorious, Ingrid Bergman, Cary Grant played the lead and here he looks at his own reflection. Vertigo is of course, known for voyeurism and scopophilia, several shots and uh, one abiding theme in Vertigo is that of obsession. Yeah, what happens when a man gets obsessed with a woman? He refuses to let go. And then at the end we realize how he has been taken for a ride. Now, blackmail 1929 and again we continue with our idea of Hitchcock as an author and how he uses sound. Now, uh, we are told that heroine in a bit to escape her uh, potential rapist, she murders the rapist with her knife, but then uh, she is guilty, you know, she knows that uh, if she gets caught, then there is no way that she could prove her innocence, that she was just trying to defend herself. So, uh, sound and even silence and in the subsequent movie, in the talky uh, version, the dialogues, they become very important and the use of word knife is repeated several times during the movie. There are several shots of knife, okay, because knife becomes a very potent object. The, if you um, uh, watch rope, they have, uh, what have they done at the beginning of the movie? It strangled a man with a rope and then after that, there are several uh, times when the dialogue, you are not on my dead body or on my dead body, I would not be caught dead doing that. Okay. He could have strangled me and all these things that are said in jest, okay. but we know how he is making use of that particular image. Okay. So, the idea of murder looms large, so that is Hitchcock. And then background score is of course, extremely notable, uh, celebrated in black, blackmail both versions. The silent version has also been worked on in terms of soundtrack. It is a recent thing okay, with the advent of technology and also uh, there are no dialogues in the silent version, but they have added a soundtrack to it. Okay. So, watch 
that version also available online. So, this is blackmail the 1929 version, the powerful talking picture this time. So, themes in Hitchcock, we are talking about authorism and the abiding themes in an author's work. You have a list of films where murder is at the center, psycho, vertigo, rear window, strangers on a train. You know which movie I am talking about is strangers on a train, strangers on a train, you know the movie, yes two strangers meet on a train and yes, you kill my wife and I kill your father, okay, that is the deal, because no one will suspect us that way and both of us will be there for each other for alibi, but then how the plan goes all right. Dial M for murder, it has been remade several times, first time with Grace Kelly, blackmail, Rebecca is spellbound, 39 steps all deal with the theme of murder. Moral ambiguity, he was one of the first directors to give this touch, moral ambiguity to his characters. I mean, if you look at the girl's character in the birds, morally quite ambiguous, she is the one who is chasing the guy. Okay, the guy does not have strong feelings for her, but she is not willing to let go of him. And then she has to be punished for that, right? A woman who transgresses her boundaries, that is the idea. So, birds become a metaphor, I mean what are those things? A town cannot be just invaded by birds, so birds is a metaphor. This is how women get punished, when they cross certain boundaries. Exactly, so that is also there, the moral ambiguity. Yeah, all relationships are ambiguous. And love and betrayal, of course, vertigo is a classic example. We have also been talking about voyeurism, several movies including Frenzy, Birds, Psycho of course, Rare Window and Vertigo. So, preoccupied with eyes and watching several close up shots of eyes. When Janet Leigh is murdered, you get a close up shot of her dead eyes looking at you directly, the gaze. Jimmy Stewart gazing at people in rear window, Jimmy Stewart gazing at Kim Novak through an opening in the door, Janet Leigh before dying, the close up shot of her dead eyes. Who played the girl's role in the remade version? There was a remade version, yeah, Anne Hesh. She has a stark resemblance. Now, um, this is another interesting sequence, uh, Rebecca and you have the great Laurence Olivier playing Maxine de Winter and Joan Fontaine playing the girl. Look at this particular shot and then look at this again a Hitchcock movie to catch a thief, Cary Grant and the great who? Who is she? Oh, classics are definitely not your strong point. You do recognize Cary Grant, yeah. And you should also recognize Princess Grace of Monaco. This is Grace Kelly, the ultimate fashion icon. So, she was all designed by Christian Dior in this movie, famously designed. I mean, if you look at her, uh, her look, her fashion in some of the movies she did with Hitchcock, it is mind blowing. It says that people have done PhD thesis on Grace Kelly and fashion, especially with reference to Hitchcock movies. Hitchcock was impeccably dressed, impeccably dressed. Um, Hitchcock's fascination with certain actors, so Cary Grant was a favorite and so was Grace Kelly and this is notorious. Uh, what was the point about the two shots? Quite a like, you know, a, a couple driving down the road and quite, you know, the mise en scene is quite similar. Did you see the mise en scene? Notorious is a scene where when she is drunk and she is driving. 
driving. Yes, even in notorious. So, uh, an author would leave his signature mark. You know, you wa watch a movie and you feel, yeah, only Scorsese could have done. Yes, likewise Hitchcock. So, again they collaborated Cary Grant and Hitchcock in North by Northwest. Do watch this movie. It is known which this, this uh, duster cropper scene where he is being chased by this down the fields. And where is where does the climax take place? Mount Rushmore. They must have created an exact replica of that. Uh, also, now his fascination for working with James Stewart. Several movies, The Man Who Knew Too, too, uh, too Much with Doris Day, another blonde. James Stewart, Grace Kelly, Rear Window. Uh, this is interesting, uh, in a room, yeah, again, again you can uh, perhaps consider the theory, Virginia Woolf. Of course, you are, some of you must be familiar with the feminist writer Virginia Woolf in her a room of her own. Virginia Woolf talks about football and fashion and she says football and sport are important. That is the kind of our society because these are associated with what? Masculinity. Yeah, so they are important. The worship of fashion, the buying of clothes are trivial. Okay. They are related with some trivial feminine pursuits, but why, then why, why football and sport? Why they are as trivial for a woman, right? Okay, and these values are invariably transferred from life to fiction. Men tell us all the time that fashion is trivial, football is important, and this is many movies, many works of art capture this philosophy. And this is something. This set of values is replicated in rare window. Okay. He is a sports photographer. Okay. He breaks his leg while capturing a spectacular shot of a racing car okay. and she is into fashion and throughout the movie he is very dismissive of her. We want, we cannot, uh, uh, you know our relationship would not work out because we are very, two very different people. I am completely outdoorsy whereas you are a fashionable girl. And at this is how the movie ends. He, he has broken his another leg after this, his fight with the villain and she is looking after him. In order to impress him, she reads uh, a book called Beyond the Himalayas or something like that. But once he sleeps off, she takes up the copy of Harper's Bazaar. <laughs> so, with Grace Kelly, he has worked in three classics, Rare Window, Dilemma for Murder, To Catch a Thief his favorite blonde. It is a MacGuffin. Are you aware of this term in Hitchcock? No. What is a MacGuffin? It is when you are in pursuit of something which you do not know what it is. It is trivial. You I see, it is a MacGuffin. What are the characters after in Notorious after all? What are they pursuing? You remember that wine cellar scene in Notorious? Yeah, what, what exactly is that? Beautifully done move, uh, shot, but what are they looking for? They do not know, they're they don't know what they are looking for. You, usually, uh, because it is an espionage thriller, so it must be some kind of a formula, a nuclear formula or some papers or some documents. But Hitchcock says the plot is important. What they are looking for is not so, this is a MacGuffin, his, his Hitchcockian term for this term, unidentified object is MacGuffin. It could be anything, you know a piece of ring, or, to catch a thief, a set of jewelry is missing, a MacGuffin, but you know it gives tremendous scope for all these beautiful people to come together and wear beautiful clothes and romp around in beautiful settings. Okay. What they are looking for is a MacGuffin, so that is Hitchcockian term, which has come to become a part of film lexicon. And this is another characteristic of an authorial touch, employing the same characters and technical crew as well. So, apart from his actors, we have already talked about, he often collaborated with 
the maestro music composer Bernard Herrmann, who was later used by Scorsese. Now, Hitchcockian legacy continues and we have uh, Anthony Hopkins playing the man himself with Helen Mirren playing his wife. The girl which is based on, which is based on Hitchcock's obsession with the actor, the, the uh, female actor who played the heroine in The Birds, okay. Tippi Hedren, Melanie Griffith's mother. The legacy continues, De Palma's 1980 movie starring, uh, My Address to Kill starring Michael Caine and Angie Dickinson is a homage to Psycho to an extent, Dress to Kill. I would also like to draw your attention to another movie, which is again uh, about voyeurism. Michael Powell, he was a British filmmaker, Peeping Tom, director Michael Powell's Peeping Tom. He is a man with the camera, he suffers from severe complexes, just like uh, Norman Bates in Psycho yeah. and he kills unsuspecting women. So, you have to watch the movie for its voyeurism and for its colors, the way Powell uses colors. It was, uh, it, it was released around the same time as Psycho, but did not become such a huge blockbuster. This is one of those rare gems, which should be watched uh, alongside Psycho. Then, the Palmas another homage to Vertigo and Rare Window, Body Double 1984. Gus Vincent literally remade Psycho, there, were, there are no changes, except that one is in black and white, the other in color and Hesh reprising Janet Leigh's role. This is my uh, all time favorite movie, Michael Douglas, Gwyneth Paltrow and a very young Vito, Viggo Mortensen, yeah. Perfect Murder, which is a rework of? reworking of dial M for murder, a jilted husband plotting to murder his rich wife. I am very sure most of you here are familiar with John Woo's MI2, Mission Impossible, which is a rip off of Notorious. In what way? What is the plot of MI2? Now, do not tell me that you have not watched MI2 as well. Have, Azhar, are you familiar with MI2? Yes? What happens? What does he do? What is the basic plot? What does he do to Tandy you Newton character? He is in love with her and what does he do to her? She is a woman. Uh, with a dubious past, just like Ingrid Bergman in Notorious. What does Cary Grant do to her? He asks her to marry a man who everyone suspects is a, a Nazi sympathizer, but they do not have enough evidence. Ingrid Bergman's job is to unearth certain secrets, those MacGuffins from that husband's uh, closet. So, when the husband suspects that his wife has been betraying him, he starts uh, killing her by slow poisoning. He gives her regular doses of arsenic in her coffee or cocoa. That is the way, that is the plan to ki kill her, but so, so that no one would suspect. If you kill her immediately, everyone would get suspicious here, uh, death by slow poisoning. And then Cary Grant at the end realizes uh, his true love for her and comes and rescues her. Spectacular scene, he carries her in his arms and walks down the steps very slowly and you would feel, aren't these steps ever going to end, because in which household do you have so many steps, okay. but you count the number when he goes up, they do not look uh, so insurmountable, okay, definitely, but when he comes up, that is an illusion that Hitchcock creates, because while he brings her and carries her uh, in his arms at the end, 
and coming down and with her husband and mother, we have a very sinister mother in law watching the scene, observing the scene. Okay. So, the suspense has to build up, therefore, more number of stairs. People have counted actually, so definitely more number of stairs while he comes down. So, what does uh, John, uh, uh, this character do in uh, Am I too? Tom Cruise, he plants Tandy Newton in the household of uh, this villain okay, in order to get uh, his hands on uh, it is a MacGuffin chimera, right? A chimera is going to start some kind of a disease, a fatal disease in the world. And then what does the villain do? He uh, abducts the heroine at the end and in order to save the hero and the world from uh, perishing, the heroine injects herself with chimera. Remember that scene? and it starts dying slowly. Okay, so, that is the plot. So, the movie was a smash hit, M I 2 of course, is a franchise, but then critics did not fail to notice the pathetic <laughs> rip off the movie was. Personally, I do like it. Easy Vacho is a remake uh, version of Hitchcock's Easy Vacho, it is one of the rare comedies which Hitchcock directed. Jessica Biel, Colin Firth, Christine Scott Thomas and Ben Barnes. So, now coming back to the arterial theory, do you have any comments on Hitchcock so far? Anything you Disturbia exactly? Rare Disturbia was a remake of Rare Window. Rare Window. Can you throw some light on Disturbia? guy punches a Spanish teacher or someone and he was uh, his Louder, louder so that we can capture you well. Uh, a guy punches his uh, student, he punches his Spanish teacher and is grounded, hmm. his house arrested, hmm. so he can't move away from his house. Hmm. So, he spies another uh, neighbor, he falls in love with a, a neighbor girl hmm. and he watches a, a, a dubious guy making, uh, kind of making a murder. Hmm. And his aspects, and he keeps on watching him. So uh, the movie was okay. So Disturbia. Yeah. Who directed it? Okay, please do your homework. Disturbia is directed by a fairly well-known director. Okay, so do your homework there. So homage to Hitchcock. That's what we are talking about. It's never ending. So he has left an indelible impression on so many people. Every once in a while, there is a major book on his uh, films, every once in a while there is a movie on his films and in many of his, uh, many of the contemporary films you can see his influences. Yeah. Even in Rebecca. Yeah, the housekeeper yeah. is a mother figure. Yes. Yeah. And uh, how she plays, or uh, even like it has an influence on the, the girls. Yes. So, those Oedipal complexes they remain unresolved in many of Hitchcockian movies. So, see, you see, Oedipal uh, trajectory is something that is very common in most Western literature. Yeah. Sinister influence of maternity, that is what Eugene O'Neill calls this element in his uh, immortal play called Desire Under the Elms, sinister influence of maternity. <laughs> okay. So, uh, while talking about authorship, so who is an author? The other day we were talking about, it is very, uh, authorism is a problematic concept, right? After all, an actor makes a movie too, he is the one who draws in the audience, am I too? We just talked about it. Okay. All we need is Tom Cruise's presence and the people will throng to the theatres. Um, we have writers, we have composers of course, and we have the producers. So, who makes a movie? So, Rola Bart in his essay, Death of the Author, 
which is contained in a volume called Image, Music and Text in 1968. So, Rola Bhatt we have often been talking about in this course while doing intertextuality and semiotics, remember. So, he put, uh, Bhatt posits that it is the reader who gives a text meaning or a viewer who gives a movie meaning. It all depends on the audience or the reader. The reader or the audience is the interpreter and then ca there can never be one definitive reading of a text. So, all of us have our own ways of looking at a text, be it a book or a painting or a film. So, responsibility finally, according to Bart, rests with the reader viewer as they need to engage with the material and become an active participant rather than just remaining pass passive participant. So, ultimately it is you my dear reader or audience who gives meaning to a work of art. Uh, I would like to suggest certain readings. So, you have a book called Hitchcock Centenary Essays which was published by British Film Institute in 1999. The occasion was 100 years of Hitchcock. When a feminist reading of Hitchcock is done, apart from Laura Mulvey's essay, uh, Visual Pleasure, The Women Who Knew Too Much, Hitchcock and Feminist Theory by Tania Modleski. And Laura Mulvey's essay, Visual Pleasure and Narrative Cinema, that is a definitive work of criticism. So, I would recommend that you look at Laura Mulvey's essay, which appeared in a screen. You can take down the citation, screen journal, it is available online. You just have to Google Visual Pleasure and Narrative Cinema. Very soon you people will start your presentations, key concepts and then second round would be on theoretical presentation and do a nice reading of Hitchcock in films. All right then, thank you very much, we meet tomorrow.